It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Good afternoon, Scott Luton here with you live on Supply Chain Now Radio. Welcome back to the show. On a quick programming note, like all of our series on Supply Chain Now Radio, you can find our replays on a variety of channels, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and wherever else you find your podcasts. As always, we'd love to have you subscribe so you don't miss anything. Supply Chain Now Radio is also brought to you by a variety of sponsors, including the Effective Syndicate, Talent Stream, Verison, SupplyChainRealEstate.com, and several other leading organizations be sure to check out the show notes to learn more about our valuable sponsors. Okay, let's welcome in my esteemed co-host here today, uh, Greg White, supply chain tech thought leader and trusted advisor. Greg, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. It's great to be back in Atlanta. It is. I feel, <laughs> it, I feel it, like it, we've been away from home for a long time. Well, you know, last Thursday and Friday, of course, we're on Charleston with the S A I A G S C A C who supply chain and, and quality conference. Yeah. And I want to say we walked away with probably 15 different sessions different episodes uh, yeah. tackling all across the world of automotive supply chain. Yeah, we had some really good uh, interviews there. Right? Absolutely. I mean, there, it, it was really interesting to see what's going on in the automotive trade, and particularly in South Carolina. Yes. A lot of growth there. There sure is, uh, and including, uh, not the least of which, uh, where Volvo put their first North American That's manufacturing right. site yes. uh, that now has employing 1,500 folks and growing. Uh, but we got back in town, reassembled the, the studio here, and we're kicking things off with a great guest, uh, Sandeep Patel, managing partner of Viridian. Sandeep, how you doing? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You bet. We've Glad. been working hard to get you here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he stays. He stays busy. He's, he's making, a busy man. He's making for sure. <laughs> he's making supply chain transformation happen. That's right. So, um, Sandeep, great to have you on the show. Great to have you. I know, I know you spent about ten years here in Atlanta, so uh, in many many ways that earns you a native badge. Anyway, yeah. so. You you know That's your right. way around and all. I think you had a great dinner in Midtown last night. Uh, and it is really neat to have you on the show after a couple conversations we've had prior. So for our audience, though, um, if you would, tell us about your background, Sandeep. Sure thing. So uh, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Um, you know, as a child, I, I think I showed a lot of propensity early on for getting into what I call a problem solving type of a discipline. Um, you I, broke your toys. I did. I did. Um, it's, it's today something my parents still remind me of on a regular basis when I visit home is, is the amount of investments that they had to make into toys that uh, were, uh, were, were essentially destroyed by me in, in an effort to try to figure out how they all work. That's and awesome. I, I was always pretty quiet and uh, kind of shy and very uh, um, reflective as a child and so naturally the inquisitiveness that I think stems from that was something that uh, um, captured me from a pretty young age and so uh, I, I had a really strong suspicion I was gonna end up in an engineering discipline um, so uh, after uh, you know really exploring that in high school went to the University of Texas at Austin um, spent most of my time focusing on electrical engineering um, did a lot of really interesting uh, work with physics as well just as a interesting kind of hobby specialty of mine just for fun physics is your hobby uh, at the time, it really was. And then, uh, wow. ironically, in the last few months, it's kind of resurfaced uh, a, a good bit. So it, it, mm, it, Very cool. Yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. You, just, you, 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 learn about the, you learn about the inner workings of the world that you don't maybe think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it really helps to kind of influence uh, how you tackle and challenge mm. problems on a day-to-day -day basis. It expands the mind, too, yeah, I would no think. Doubt. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, you like breaking stuff. <laughs> you, you like understanding the laws of physics. What else about uh, Sandeep Patel? Would our listeners be interested in knowing? I think if you talk to the people that knew me best, they'd, they'd say I'd have uh, I'd some some pretty intense passions like those two that are a little bit out of the norm, I'd say, between work and, and uh, just furthering my education. But yeah. beyond that, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in movies, and I feel like the artistic side of things, again, really helped to balance us in our professional lives. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'd say over the last decade, we saw a lot of specialization across all disciplines, and I think now we're actually seeing a little bit of a retreat away from that. 
where people are realizing that our consciousnesses are all very complex tapestries and it's not uh, it's not necessarily about just being great at one being really great at one thing the, the yeah. people that diversify are the ones that tend to be the most successful in life mm. and I try to draw a lot of uh, a, a lot of parallels from that into what mm. we do for a living wow. so you mentioned movies I gotta ask you I knew you were gonna go there <laughs> all of the intellectual stuff you just said you're gonna go straight to movies that's where I was going to by the way yeah good 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 so tell us uh, uh, top three list or just one of your favorite go-to movies that that each time you watch it you pick up something new uh, I, it's it's interesting you mentioned that because I think that's one of the things that I enjoy most about movies um, I don't know if a ton of people that are uh, traditional movie buffs would agree with any of these choices um, because I'm always really fascinated with the mechanics of how the movie was made mm-hmm. when I'm watching a movie I'm interested in the storyline I'm trying to follow the plot I'm you know enjoying the cinematics of it the visuals of it but what I'm really interested in understanding is thinking about how the director and the writers were coming up with these plot devices or coming up with um, a lot of the technical details that they use and specifically for movies um, I, I really come back to um, in, Inception and so I think that's always a, a, a really interesting one that's done that yeah. confuses a lot of people because the plot's obviously um, fairly complicated and regardless of all the holes I think it's just such a beautifully constructed movie yeah. where he's trying to do so many things uh, the, uh, the creator and uh, director Christopher Nolan he's trying to do so many things simultaneously and weave these like really interesting narratives um, all behind the kind of uh, um, you know visage of a uh, of a heist movie right mm, yeah and so mm. like that that that's what I always uh, love to kind of point to is the fact that it's how do you tell people an interesting story expand their mind a little bit maybe make them a little smarter make them think a little bit but all within this like very um, aesthetic vessel yeah mm. wow that's a great movie for that I mean it's hard to get more ethereal than that yeah. movie right mm. that's a good one. yeah that's cool so moving right along from from how we kind of take a step back out of the the real world and and let's talk about what you did pr- and we're, we're going to talk about viridian in a second here but, but prior to fi- founding viridian yeah you worked at manhattan associates which which most folks in the supply chain world would quickly recognize especially the folks that have spent some time here what did you do at manhattan yeah so i i took a job uh, with manhattan right out of college and so it's one of the reasons I ended up moving to Atlanta. Uh, I, at the time, like I said, had an electrical engineering degree. And after working um, uh, through internships and just like other jobs, et cetera, I had a I had a sense that something about that industry was going to feel very lacking for me. And I think it was because I was looking for a job that was much more collaborative. And all the places I had worked at that point, and this is, you have to remember, before the big Silicon Valley tech boom that had happened, right. it was very siloed in the engineering world. You kind of sat at a desk. Maybe you worked with a small team, but you really lived in your own bubble. And one of the things that I picked up from an early age was the ability to uh, communicate technical concepts very easily to people. And so I, it really led me to a, a, a passion of wanting to get into consulting. And so I ended up working for Manhattan's consulting arm. Uh, many people obviously know them for producing some best of breed software in the supply chain world, obviously, but I worked for their professional services organization. Okay. And so um, originally I worked in a group that was specifically responsible for implementing their warehouse management management application and just making sure that uh, a lot of their uh, uh, very important customers were um, satisfied with the technology that they were implementing. So when was that? Um, that would have been, let's see, around 2007 to 2011. I was okay. there for about four years. Okay. Wow. So you Those should... were big years. Mm. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You shared some of your lessons learned there, and you, you referred to the silos, and, and you also kind of referred to what you were good at and, yeah. and what, what caused you to want more and more. But what were some other early lessons that you learned about the world of supply chain technology? I think the biggest thing that's interesting for most people that don't do this for a living or maybe are just on the operations side and don't think about the technology side as much is learning to adjust your expectations for kind of the uh, out-of-box software that we deal with on a day-to-day basis that helps us run our lives versus these types of business systems that really are the backbone of, you know, oftentimes multi-billion dollar organizations. And specifically for companies like Manhattan, one of the things that I definitely did not appreciate until I was really living a day-to-day was they really do have to be everything to everybody. And I don't think most people appreciate that kind of challenge. You know, we're partners with uh, Manhattan, JDA, High Jump, 
happen. Those three types of companies, let's say in the warehouse management space to start, right. they have to be able to fulfill the needs of customers that require systems that support food and beverage operations, as well as retailers, as well as automotive companies. High fashion, exactly. all of that. They, right? they, they have totally to, different dynamics. Exactly. And, and all of these companies have yeah. very intense and rigorous requirements and are trying to meet certain dollars and, and uh, customer service levels. And at the end of the day, these software packages have to be everything to everybody. And so when I initially went in, there was always this sense of like, oh, well, why don't you do X? Why don't you do Y? You know, when I use Microsoft Windows, it operates like this. Right. And, and, and you really start to realize that um, creating technology solutions for complex businesses is, you know, and, and this sounds really reductive to say, but creating systems that have to support complex businesses is just vastly different than creating kind of general, generic, consumer-driven, out-of-the-box software for just you and I as, as, as kind of home users. Well, as home users, we can adapt, right? We have a, we have a constituency of one. Right, and if you're a, if you're a corporation, so I, we talked a little bit about the fact that I was when I was at a uh, automotive uh, retailer in Phoenix, then called Northern Automotive. We implemented Manhattan's uh, warehouse system, and we not only had differences because we were a retailer, not an individual dealing with software, but we had differences within the organization. Our Reno DC had different requirements because of the product that it 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 had flowing through it than our DC in Texas, right? And, or Phoenix. And um, all of those things have to be accommodated in one piece of software. Then you think about the differences that a fashion retailer has, or, or as you mentioned, food with, you know, with limited shelf life and things like that. There are all sorts of differences, right? Volume, volume, margin, um, and product type tend to define those customizations, if you want to call them that, that are required mm. within an entity. Yeah. Mm. Right? Speaking of food, did you know uh, Sandeep was named a rock star in the world of food logistics? How about that on the heels of, of spending time with Ward Richmond, who toured the world with his wow. band, but with our second rock star in less than two weeks? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> That's we'll pretty talk, good. We'll, we'll touch more on that in a second. Now that I know he's in, he's so into the food industry, I'm going to have to try a lure. Is that, that's where you went. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm <laughs> All right. We so, know he's an expert. <laughs> so now let's talk about Viridian. Uh, Sandeep, I think you, you've done a great yeah. job of kind of setting the stage for uh, starting to answer this next question. But, but you know, going back to the why is so important, especially these days. I think all of us, when we, when we meet with business leaders or, or uh, our organizational leaders or, you know, or entrepreneurs in general, mm -hmm. you know, why they start companies, why they start um, uh, noble missions, why they start uh, uh, products, new ideas, you name it. So what was your why for founding Viridian? I'd say the biggest reason was I had noticed that there was an opportunity to try to become more efficient in, in, in ultimately what we were delivering, right? Um, I was working at an as an independent contractor at the time, and so just kind of doing my own thing, trying to help out where I could, provide expertise where I could. And it became very quickly to me that uh, there was a lot of complacency and stagnance in, in, in the supply chain world. Mm. And wanting to find ways to try to just push things forward was always, the, the I'd say, the core driver. Um, also, time Timing wise, you know, we started Viridian in, in 2011 or late 2011, and that was also around the time where everybody I felt like universally had agreed that you know supply chain had become this very, very uh, distinct um, vertical, if you will, in right. any important business. And we no longer were convincing people that they needed to upgrade their supply chain systems. Everybody, had, it, it, it was universal. Everybody universally agreed that there was always ROI, that there was always benefit. However, could you do it efficiently enough to make sure you realize that? that ROI. Yeah. And so our focus as an organization at the time in its infancy was to quickly then realize that what we needed to do was no longer convince people that they needed to acknowledge the supply chain and, and invest in it. It was like, how do we help you invest in it quickly, efficiently, so that way you're getting all the realization of that ROI that you're looking for? Because we had started hearing so many horror stories of people kicking initiatives off that ultimately just spiraled out of control. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the scope creep just became unmanageable, mm -hmm. right? What do you what is it this is what is it that you th you do differently that you think is 
uh, you know, that that you recognize that was causing that to happen? What is it? How is, have you reconciled that issue? Um, it, it, it took me a while to bake this into our philosophy, and, and I actually uh, took this away from working with organizations that did nothing related to supply chain. Mm. I started picking the brains of other entrepreneurs who uh, ran financial services companies, financial implementation companies, other tech services companies, just a bunch of different people that I'd kind of met um, throughout the way. And, and really, the biggest thing that they all told me was to simplify your approach to everything. And, and the most mm. interesting advice I got in that was finding ways to remove emotional components from your decision making. Um, I think what most people realize is that at a, lot of, at a lot of different organizations and companies, you are oftentimes with key decisions led to one person having to make that choice. Yep. And so making sure that my partner, Jason Rosing and I, who I founded Viridian with, um, had a good back and forth and a series of checks and balances to make sure that we were never making um, impulsive decisions to either feed our egos or to convince people of things that were not necessarily in the company's best interest. And um, outside of that, I think one of the um, uh, real things that that has helped to inspire is like a very strong dedication for the truth. I think with really complex technology systems, it's easy to have a sense of complacency and understanding how they work and what that means. And so what we always do, and, and one of the common things that we have in, in many of our uh, think tanks and, and group sessions that we do together is making sure that we're challenging each other to find those deeper answers. And so always asking each other, you know, are we at the bottom yet? Mm. Have we figured out every detail of everything that transpires? Or are we making implicit assumptions that we've not called out? Yeah. And making sure to avoid those emotional decisions and implicit assumptions, I think are probably the two bedrocks of what's made us really successful. Yeah, mm. that's, that's really important. I mean, to, to take the emotion out of it and then to, to see the solution all the way through. It's so natural when you think about trying to train somebody to do a job, right? If, if it's a job you've been doing for any period of time, you skip over 40% of the steps or more because they're ingrained in, mm -hmm. into you, right? And you have to explicitly state all of those in order to solve the problem. That's a, that's a really good approach. Yeah, in, implicit assumptions. It's It's been, um, you know, from a culture standpoint, it's one of the things that we've really focused on as an organization um, that this year in 2019 is we, uh, we're just making sure that everything that we are assuming that's just baked into the way we think mm -hmm. um, is, is articulated to somebody. And it's a challenge and when we're by no means successful all the time, but it's been a real learning experience, I think, for everybody to just showcase to us that on our day-to-day -day lives with the people that we've known for a long time, how many assumptions that we make. And, and you know, I, in my experience, those those are the things that derail projects and derail successful um, implementations of really anything. We, you know, you're, you're fighting uh, the human element when, when it comes to tackling implicit assumptions because mm -hmm. it's it, the challenge is so far beyond just supply chain, but it's who we are, right? Yeah. It's so dangerous, these assumptions we make on an hourly basis. Um, all right, so let's continue down this line and then tell us a little, little bit more around what the Viridian organization provides. So at the simplest of levels, what I tell people that don't work in the supply chain world is that we are supply chain problem solvers. So anything from order capture and digital commerce uh, through the fulfillment lifecycle, warehousing, transportation, order management, um, oftentimes with the procurement and um, your manufacturing sides as well. We really just love solving problems with technology in the supply chain space. And so our business is really divided into three major groups. We have a kind of design and advisory practice that really just focuses on high level supply chain transformation initiatives and walking executives through what we've seen be really effective and, and providing our guidance and, and solutions that we've implemented successfully in the past. We have a professional services arm, which is probably our biggest group, where where we are the people that are boots on the ground doing the actual solutioning, um, you know, the real core of the problem solving at a very tactical level, helping people's dreams become realities, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then we also have a product offering, which was originally built to help be our consultants be more effective. That has now become kind of a third stream of our business as well, where we've focused a lot of time and energy into tools and utilities and now products that help to make the implementation process better. We, we Once we realized that it wasn't a matter of convincing people that they needed to do these projects, that right. we just needed to show them how to do it efficiently and quickly and save a lot of money doing it. Um, it, it became a really appetizing thing for many of our customers. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, you know, it's... it's uh, amazing to see how often you you create a product for your internal use that becomes valuable to to a, a greater whole, right? And I think 
that's something that I've seen happen so often that have actually turned into businesses for companies. So that's interesting that you were able to do that as yeah, well. Yeah, and if you think about it, it makes a ton of sense, right? If, if, if you're somebody who's trying to create something, whether it's somebody like us who's just trying to have utilities to, to be better and faster, or let's say you're trying to develop the next new um, exciting app out in California, right. whatever it may be, you, you realize that if, if you're building something that you yourself would would use you're you're honoring a certain sense of yourself as a part of that and uh, I, I think that's really important because I think another reason that really um, that, that we do well is I think people know that we really believe in these products like I don't I don't uh, just go out and try to hawk our automate platform to, to people because it's a it's a revenue stream for us I do it because I really believe in it I, I yeah. originally built it um, you know for ourselves and so um, and then that's ultimately what made it popular too so I, I, I think that goes a long way in being able to really support and stand behind something you genuinely believe in. And I think people pick up on that. Yeah, well, and one of the biggest hurdles to adopting technology is show me somebody who's been successful using it. And when it's you, that's a that's really a great story. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think that speaks volumes to be able to do that. Yeah. Congratulations. Absolutely. Uh, very rewarding. All right. So, so let's shift the gears here, a sec, uh, here uh, with this next question. So what do you believe, Sandeep, are some of the biggest gaps related to project to both project and implementation and management in the business world today? Yeah, I've um, I, I run into a few fairly regularly. One that's really interesting to me is the fact that our technology solutions are still fairly siloed. If you think about the supply chain space, everything's still pretty segmented. You've got warehouse management systems, transportation systems, ordering systems, demand planning, procurement, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, it, and it continues to grow. And we've gotten better at communicating within these systems and, and sending information back and forth. And as technology continues to evolve will we'll, we'll do well but the human element of that still doesn't really go away because these silos that we create still just naturally pose challenges structurally right. um, the example that I love to give people a lot is if you think about transportation and warehousing that is a really really nice meeting point of two of these different silos and if you think about the importance to your business it's one of the really critical marriages in terms of being able um, if, if you just think about shipping costs in general like it's it's definitely a transportation heavy world but the warehousing how we box things how we package them up how we palletize them how we have them ready for uh, the carrier that's going to pick them up all of those components are very tightly integrated still and we haven't really began to solve those problems in my mind from a technology standpoint we're getting a lot closer and we're getting better but mm. that's one that I see that's um, in my opinion ignored really often and so from a project perspective you have sometimes um, different product owners or different project teams that are implementing these two products and it's uh, um, it, it becomes a challenge because neither really goes into it with that right kind of mindset and mentality. And so I think being able to level set with people across um, various businesses and business units like that to, to learn to collaborate together on meeting overall company objectives, right? If, if you're looking to find ways to provide your customers, um, let's say Amazon style uh, shipping options so that right. they're getting their products as fast as possible. That's not something that you can just say, hey, WMS team, go figure it out. Hey, transportation team, go figure it out. These Take are it faster. Exactly. Exactly. Right, it takes like these are these are joint initiatives yeah. that companies have to think about at an enterprise level, and, and ultimately, and, and this leads into my second piece, which is creating the appropriate incentives for these people and teams to not only work together but embrace change. Yep. The, the cultural impact of these projects is always so ignored in my mind, in the sense that we have all these people that oftentimes we're thrusting change upon massive, massive amounts of change, which through you know millions of years of human existence we know that we generally don't love, or at least right. not initially. And so being able to create the world where we have incentives for people to want to buy into this change, want to buy into this progress, and so that they're much more collaborators rather than resistors of it, I think, is is really critical. An example I'll give of that is... Um, right, right quick before you share an example, is this something that I can use on my three kids at home? And embracing change is <laughs> a, a different vibe or something we can... Honestly, I think you'll Maybe notice... Maybe that's the example. Yeah. <laughs> I think you'll notice a lot of the things I talk about, though, I, I'm, I'm trying to draw from other aspects of my life so that way they are applicable everywhere and I think that's been the real key is that it's probably not that there is some secret sauce to supply chain as much as it is that just like with anything else you have to keep a sound mind you know draw from all of your life experiences and everything you know and, and just make the best uh, yeah. best decision for yourself for your org and and the the example I was going to give was um, a few years ago back when we really saw an uptick in everybody coming to us saying hey we, we really got to move uh, from a multi-channel approach to an omni-channel type of a world and the uh, uh, the first thing I always uh, heard was what, what types of technology 
strategies? What order management system? What warehousing system do I need to get? Right. How am I going to make this successful? And I said, Omnichannel is more of a mindset than it is right. like a systemic right. thing that you're going to do or a structural thing you're going to do. And in, until you, at a corporate level, at a cultural level, can incentivize these organizations that have historically been pitted against each other to now start sharing and collaborating, you're going to have a very difficult time because the incentives just aren't there. Mm -hmm. I, I think all human behavior is driven by incentives. We've seen that pretty uh, pretty vividly over the course of human history. Right. And so um, I think from a project uh, management and implementation standpoint, incentives are another thing that are just very, very often overlooked mm -hmm. and uh, one of the big challenges to making these things successful. I think your ability, you, you, you were brought an emotional question. Right? How do we get from multi-channel to omni-channel? And there's a very fine line, like you said, maybe even just a perspective of what the real difference there is. And you have to manage that emotion at the start of a project, right? You have to get people thinking rationally rather than thinking in keywords and phrases and, wow. and get them to understand the bigger picture here uh, as you as you start to bring them into this kind of transition. Yeah, absolutely. If, uh, we had a, an example that even comes to mind where we had uh, ultimately three vice presidents that oversaw the three channels of an organization that wanted to move to omni-channel. And what I think people forget about is, is the, the human element of that. Yep. These, are, these are three individuals that had, did, had slaved away at their jobs to climb to uh, you know certain heights that I'm sure that they always really aspired to and wanted to. And uh, um, on paper, the idea of moving to an omni-channel world makes tons of sense for the business. But right. these are now three individuals who have to reconcile that uh, you know they, they've, they've kind of climbed to the top of their little world and, and now it's changing consistently and, and pretty aggressively. And so yeah. being able to make sure that those key stakeholders are, are really invested in your project is, is another thing I see just overlooked quite a bit. Well, and a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the issues that have been created in supply chain have been because of the existing structure of companies. Look, I, I've worked, I've worked with a lot of traditional retailers who, when they decided they were going to go e-commerce in the late '90s, right, or whenever it was, um, they had a separate organization. They built an entirely separate organization because the store operations and the traditional merchandising organization didn't want that web thing dragging down their their bonus. You talk about incentives. That the, those incentives are part of the reason that the solution for for e-commerce is so complex now, right? I mean, in in reality, this is going to sound Pollyannish a little bit, <laughs> but in reality, I mean, not to oversimplify it, why is a web, you know, why is an e-commerce platform not an additional outlet like a store? It's not because we restructured the organizations of re at retail so that we took the risk away from the existing organizations and placed it on a new organization, which inherently created duplication of nearly every task in the, in the supply chain. Mm. We all love our WeWork, rework, right? We love duplication. Yes. <laughs> but we love our bonuses, which is really the Absolutely. That's, that's really the the impetus for that. So, yeah. um, and, and and I think our audience heard from Chica, our mascot, a second ago. Um, so, let's talk about some of your other experiences. And, and she felt very strongly. Yeah. About about that. <laughs> transformation. Yeah. <laughs> Sandeep, uh, I can tell just sitting in through the first twenty five or so minutes for our interview, you, everything is connected in your mind and 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 it's really fast i didn't pick this up on our earlier conversations but clearly as you describe um what your you know your lessons learned and, and kind of your approach to not just business but life everything is very interwoven it's very interesting and very deep by the way i'm going to go back and study on some concepts well you can see why inception is his favorite movie <laughs> i mean you really point. can can't you point. i mean truthfully he thinks in that way a lot right but, yeah uh, i realized by the way that this conversation was over my head when he said physics for fun, that's, um, yeah, you, you, I, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't ordinarily say this, but you, you are a very special mind. I mean, you, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that when you are exceptional, you have to recognize and acknowledge that you don't have to brag about it, but you have to acknowledge that. And you do have a very special perspective on things and you're very intentional and thoughtful, um, about, 
topics that are and are not mm. naturally interwoven. So that I think that probably bodes, you know, has probably been a huge contributor to your success. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I, I do like to think that the just the yeah the breadth of experiences does does contribute a lot to it. Every um every every type of book I've read on the matter and every person I kind of talk to in life that's really successful, they they talk about almost they almost never have specialized that they just they try to approach each situation with the with, with, with the same um, I'll call it problem solving framework mm -hmm. and, and the first time somebody told me about having a problem solving framework it really really stuck with me and because um, it was somebody who had spent a long time in the aviation industry then went to go work for Wall Street um, then had a little stint in supply chain really just bounced around and, and followed his heart a lot and, and that that was a um, really um, I think foundational advice that he gave me is like if, if you can just learn to solve problems in the sense of taking inputs remove emotional concepts and just make the best decision possible with all the parameters you have known to you uh, you're generally going to be fine in life and so yeah. I try to use that a lot yeah mm. that's powerful. obvious all right so let's 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 uh, gather some of your other observations and you, you, Sandeep you've worked with some of the bigger more recognizable names certainly in supply chain if not beyond uh, between Manhattan Associates high jump JDA software so what are some of your um, how business is done observations that you've made uh, that our listeners could benefit from? I, I think the most interesting thing in, in working with all those uh, best of breed packages there is, is, is just the gateway that you start to get into the insights of how different types of businesses run and, and just all these different industries and verticals and how it all kind of comes together. And, um, you know, originally I thought it was really fascinating in terms of, uh, oh, like these are the unique types of problems people are solving. But mm. the, the thing that, again, that that I come back to that I find the most interesting in, in terms of how all those co companies are, are starting to behave now is they're really starting to take a lead, in my opinion, from uh, Silicon Valley and just kind of more modern consumer-driven tech. Um, you know, for decades, we saw a very standoffish Microsoft, um, just chest puffed out. We're the best. We don't do um, any work with other uh, organizations. We don't build a ton of integrations with other types of products. Right. And I'd say in the last 10 years or so, they've really shifted away from that really? and have gone to a much more collaborative model because I think yeah. just like with the rest of the world we've realized that um, we were heading toward a much more individually driven consumer experience because of technology people have the scale and reach that we've never had before and so now we are no longer thinking about uh, groups of individuals we're thinking about an actual individual themselves and so <laughs> I think what's been really interesting with a lot of these technology companies is how they've embraced a lot of those same um, types of philosophies uh, scalability is a, is a really great example of one um, you know some of these organizations are moving to um, SaaS based uh, you know transportation warehousing order management systems right. being able to provide um, the smallest startup with the supply chain needs that they have at an affordable price and being able to scale that up to you know a, a, a fortune five type of a company if, yeah. if, if that's the, the the road their journey leads them down mm -hmm. and so I think that scalability has been a really interesting kind of advent and hallmark in our space I don't think we've ever really seen anything like it before um, we, we've, we've certainly worked with a, a lot of smaller customers over the last decade or so that have told us things like, oh, well, we can't um, afford to purchase package X because it's it's typically for, you know, much larger industrial scale types of organizations. And I, I think uh, that that's been one of the really, uh, um, you know, interesting movements forward. And, and in that same vein, I think we see a lot of uh, a focus on being nimble, right? No uh, doubt. Technology is evolving continually faster and faster. So it's not only is it um, evolving at a faster rate, but it's accelerating at a faster rate now. And so being in that constant state of flux and change is really important. And I think a lot of, um, you know, originally speaking, even as recently as 10 years ago, um, the, these software packages seemed a little bit bulkier, a little bit bigger, a little bit harder to, to move, if you will. And, and I think um, all of the organizations, you know, even some of the ones in the ERP space like Oracle and SAP, everybody's moving to a, uh, trying to become more and more nimble because now that everybody knows the value of these systems, they also are incentivized to make sure that uh, it's quicker. And then lastly, I think the thing that's really cool is the openness of it. Just like I was kind of of talking about with Microsoft and how uh, they're learning to partner more and more with other products yeah. outside their ecosystem. I think all these companies are learning to do the same. You know, we, we see a lot of conversation around warehouse execution systems and other types of communication. Let's say you have, uh, you know, uh, JDA WMS and Manhattan's transportation system, learning how those two systems can talk to one another. Um, I, I think you're seeing people embrace partnerships more, realizing that the individual consumer, even though if you kind of transpose that to a business landscape, that in individual business still wants to slice and dice their technology ecosystem however they choose and mm -hmm. so they want to choose partners and providers that allow 
them that flexibility and openness of being able to say, hey, we're going to use this module from this specific package and this other module from this other package because that's what meets our needs. All right. Mm. Right. And the technology exists today to enable that, right, with APIs. I mean, it used to be that one of the ways that people kept closed as opposed to open was they would hold their integration very close to the vest. They wouldn't. There were companies, I recall, when I was in, in the automotive trade, they didn't even allow the customers to have access to the data. Um, and, you know, I think of where those companies are now. Hopefully, they've gone straight to hell, which is where they deserve to be. Um, no, I think of where those companies are now, and they don't exist, right? I mean, it is rare that anyone, including Apple, who in the 80s held their data and their, their solutions very close to the vest, even they have, have integration capabilities as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, they're, it, it, it's necessary. It is personalization. So, we had uh, Cindy Lago on... Um, a few weeks ago from uh, Capgemini, and she was talking about personalization uh, um, of the of the e-commerce or the retail environment. She called it uh, a batch of one. It's not dissimilar in that a, a B2B organization might want that same kind of consideration of their technology s solutions, right? Yeah. I mean, long gone are the days of, are you an IBM shop? Are you an Oracle shop? That's, this is yeah. kind of the question that was asked, you know, 15, 20 years ago right. in, in the technology space. Now, people have realized that there are um, an abundance of options and uh, they should uh, choose the ones that make the most sense for their organization. Pick yeah. and choose. Think of it uh, like just like a technology buffet, if you will. Yeah. We have our show title. Thank you very much, Cindy. The technology buffet. I love that. Uh, but, but, you know, that that's going back to what you said way back when. Uh, you got kind of a knack of, of, of sharing complex technology solutions or concepts concepts in a simple way. I think that's a great example. Everyone can picture a buffet. Everyone's been through a buffet. And that's kind of where we have evolved to, right? Um, all right. So, so let's go broader here again. So let's talk about in the bigger picture, uh, Indian supply chain uh, industry. What are one or two trends or challenges or issues that are on your radar more than others right now? Um, I'd say the thing that comes to us the most right now is uh, customers, both existing and prospective, coming to us saying, hey, we really need to implement artificial artificial intelligence into our supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so many opportunities for us to be having savings. And the question I always ask back to them is really, if you have any examples, please share those um, with me. Because I and, I, and I ask in, in a very earnest way in the sense that, you know, narrow the scope down for me. Yep. And I always get answers that are pretty empty for the most part. Um, and, and I think this is a really good example. Uh, artificial intelligence, in my opinion, is 100% a tool in the toolbox. Um, that, that That is something that has a time and a place in, in, in how it's evolved currently today. Uh, but it's not this be-all, end-all solution for everything. Like I was talking about before, I think people see technologies and oftentimes feel the need to adapt to them just because they know it's new and they know it's sexy and they might think or somebody told them that it's going to be the next big thing. Mm. And so we have lots of people coming to us because they are not only taking account themselves, but the uh, organizations that they lead, the oftentimes you know, multi-billion dollar publicly traded organization that they lead, they have to make sure that they are uh, uh, doing the best for the people that um, that rely on them. And so they're oftentimes led with these very complex decisions, and it's hard to remove your emotions from it. Right. But, um, that, that's one of the big reasons I always tell people is talk to somebody on the outside. Don't internalize it because you ultimately will be at the mercy of your own decisions. And the worst part is, is we don't even know when we do it. Mm. We, we, we rationalize things in, in so many different ways in our own heads that uh, that kind of external accountability really helps with. And so Artificial intelligence is one that I, uh, I, I spoke at um, um, a conference about earlier this year because it's something we've invested a lot of own, our own internal dollars and cents into to really figure out what problems should we be solving mm -hmm. because it's Thank such you. a wide breadth of a tool set and there are so many problems available to be solved in our industry, I feel like, or at least areas for improvement. And so being able to find the right ways to do it and, and transportation planning has been one that I've personally found super interesting because there are so many uh, potential variables and variants and being able to pull in weather projections and mm -hmm. um, understanding how that impacts demand, which is another area that we play around a lot with this stuff in the demand planning space, right? Artificial intelligence to me in supply chain right now is at its most meaningful when it's ultimately trying to recreate um, or forecast kind of buying demands or mm -hmm. supply chain demands and then taking into things like, oh, when it's particularly hot, um, you know, companies that, uh, you know, one of our customers is a big uh, um, a water distributor. 
uh, when it's really hot, uh, the, their sales go up. And so being able to take really rudimentary information and, and bake it into uh, forecasting and planning, stuff like that, I think there's tons of really practical um, applications of it. But um, there are also many people that say, hey, here's a problem, and I want you to use artificial intelligence right. to solve it. And we come back a lot of times and say like that, that we don't need to. Like there, there, are, there are simple, just, you know, linear algebra solutions that can solve these problems. Like there, there are no um, human elements. There are no unknowns or variables that we're trying to quantify and simulate. Right. We know everything here. Intuit. Right. Exactly. If exactly. You're, if you're, you know, if you, if you wonder whether you need... Uh, artificial intelligence. I was at a conference in, uh, I think, April, and Danny Longa, who has uh, Unity Interactive, so it's a they use AI for gaming, and he is arguably one of the the top minds in AI. He gave some examples of some things that aren't AI. Siri, for example, is not AI, but, right? That's linear programming. Um, and when you think about those problems that that don't require AI. You, you realize that sometimes, and we're in that stage with this application, it's sometimes a solution looking for a problem. And Absolutely. like you, you get out of the emotion. You look for you. You look for what is the goal? What is the solution? That you know what? What is it we're trying to accomplish? And then develop a solution that's appropriate for it. And maybe it's AI, and maybe it's not. Um, and we're narrowing in on that. And you know, and I think the the um, beauty of that is that AI has become so commoditized already, thanks to our friends at Google and, and AWS and Microsoft, that that you can try it versus linear programming in, in a fairly affordable way, and you can prove that this is a problem that doesn't require all of that learning. Yep. Right? Hmm. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. It's good to hear somebody speak rationally about AI. Yeah, because and and it's, I think that's the case for everything, not even just AI, yes. right? It's always just... It, Technology in general. It's tools in a toolbox. It's, yeah. That's what I always try to tell people. And, and the better you're going to get at problem solving, you're just going to add more tools to that toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to implement AI for a solution that you've ill conceived and watch it learn really really fast how to do things wrong. Well, it's, right. it's like a customer saying, "Hey, I want I want a great hole dug, but I want you to use this wrench." <laughs> you wouldn't use. I mean, you know, the right tools at the right time, yeah. not leading with the tools first. You lead with the problem and exactly and uncover what the, the best solution may be. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm taking some no, I like some tips from to, Sandeep. Why don't you use this wrench? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's switch gears here. Uh, I really uh, as I was checking out y'all's website, Sandeep. I, I love the uh, the blogs and, and some of the content y'all put out. And one caught my eye, and, and this is one evidently it's been pretty well received across the digital stratosphere, uh, the state of automation and warehouse management. Uh, so tell us, what were your top three key takeaways from this white paper? I think the most interesting thing, and, and I, I suspect it had something to do with some of its popularity, is, is the kind of raw numbers it presents on people in the next two years, what they're planning to do with their supply chain technology investments. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for a company like ours that focuses on transformation projects, that's pretty pertinent and interesting data. And I think the thing that most people are really uh, interested in there is just the amount of organizations that have stated that in the next two years, they're going to be investing pretty heavily in various types of automation technologies and, and really just understanding which ones, right? If, I, if I'm a company like Viridian or really anybody in the supply chain space, I see that uh, companies are willing to shell out big bucks on automation. And, and this is an industry that people are really interested in. And it's an industry that uh, obviously has been around for a while, but is evolving pretty quickly in the last, I'd say, five years or so. And so people have a good track record of working with a lot of these types of companies. And they also have a good baseline of understanding kind of what type of physical automation, um, you know, sorry, what the uh, um, overall requirements are to successfully do one of these physical automation projects, because mm -hmm. so many people have experiences putting in conveyor systems and other right. things over the course of the last 20, 30 years or so. And so I I, that was probably the most interesting thing is that uh, this is an industry that it looks like it's going to continue to see more and more investment. So um, it doesn't feel like we've uh, hit the top here in any stretch. It looks like people are just doubling down even further. And so obviously somebody that it's in that space, I was really excited to see that. Um, and, and that was probably, I'd, I'd say to me, the, the, the biggest uh, the, the biggest thing that was interesting. But then if you, if you kind of dive in a little further into what technologies people are going to be investing in, which the white 
paper also dives into, you start to see some really interesting things. Technologies that have been around for a while, I was g expecting to see that people would be phasing them out. That some of the newer technologies in the supply chain space, people would be planning on investing high dollars in that and not spending so much time in, around upgrades of conveyor systems and other technologies that might be a little bit more antiquated. But what we ended up finding is that not only do people want to spend high dollars in the new technologies, they are also really happy and content with their current technology set so much so that they're going to be upgrading those. And so I, I like to think of it as really layering on your supply chain tech and, and automation. And that's what I really love to see hmm. is that it's not necessarily an ecosystem of just kind of rebirth and death where um, you know companies are just kind of coming and going because they have an idea. It's really good. That idea is no longer relevant in today's time and it dies off. What we're seeing in supply chain is the technology is getting better, but the existing technologies are also in and of themselves improving. And I always just really enjoy that because when I first tried to explain to my parents what supply chain was, they were really confused. Like and everyone. So, right. And yeah, so yeah. any industry where I, you know, I, I, I yeah. see a, an upward trend, I'm, I'm always uh, pretty, uh, pretty excited by. And then I think the last thing is probably at the, at the most minute level there is specifically, I, I, one of the things I was really interested in seeing is that I think 57% of the uh, uh, people surveyed there talked about how they were going to be investing in picking automation um, in the next two years, hmm. which is a pretty uh, significant number there. And it, and it coincides with the smell test. What we see a lot is customers coming to us today talking about what I would consider a warehouse execution system or you know some type of picking automation system. Yeah. And uh, again, for, for those who are currently either building or have those types of warehouse execution systems, again, it continues to look very promising for that industry. So I think those are the most interesting things that I found is um, the types of uh, uh, dollars people were investing and in what magnitude is also where. Picking is a great example of moving towards automation because it, you know there was such an enormous level of error in that when it was fully human operated. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, voice picking and visual picking and you know Google Glass picking. Even even in though many of those were just experiments, some of them actually got implemented and you could see them working towards solving the problem with with some level of automation. Look and look, automation is. You know, I think it's been sort of a four-letter word for a long time, but the truth is 10,000 people are leaving the job force every single day, right? And that's going to continue probably up to or through 2030 um, as the baby boomers leave the workforce. And there aren't enough in the next couple generations to replace them. So automation is not going to take people's jobs. It's going to layer on, enhance uh, people's jobs, and it's going to do the jobs, much like AI is doing today, it's going to do the jobs that aren't ideally fit for humans, right? I mean, it's the mundane, it's the repetitive, it's the dangerous sometimes that uh, that needs to be done. And we would love to protect human beings from having to do those things and make their job experience much more satisfying. So I, I think it's a, you know, it's a natural progression. And, um, you know, historically, I've, I've studied it anecdotally, but historically, you see it accrue to the benefit of humans and allowing us to use our greater gifts more effectively. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Well put. Well put. Okay, and, and, and to our listeners, you can check out uh, all of the blog articles and white papers on the Viridian.info website. Um, all right, so we're big fans of trade shows. We love getting out, and, 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 and we're doing a lot of this, right? They're, they're, of course, what yeah. we do at Splash Now Radio is creating digital content. It's kind of tough to create digital content if you don't sit down and talk with people. you know. So we love getting out to trade shows and industry conferences like we did last week and, and talking with folks that, that, rep that come from a wide variety of walks of life that are solving a wide variety of problems that are facing uh, the Indian supply chain industry. Um, so what uh, on, on the Viridian calendar, any big trade shows coming up the rest of the year? Um, I don't want to say too many for the rest of the year. Our, our big trade show seasons typically in spring, but uh, uh, and, and the ones that we really love to go to are just, you know with our obviously with our partners JDA High Jump Manhattan. Um, but one, one of the ones we went to earlier this year is our first time attending was Shop Talk, uh, which I think is now in like its third or fourth year, and uh, it, it, it was a really interesting uh, trade show for us in the sense that I've never really seen that much invested into a purely um, it's not purely 
necessarily a supply chain, but obviously there's a large, very large supply chain component to it. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the resources and the turnout and just the overall production of, of how that trade show goes. And, and the thing that I love the most is they philosophically have, have really captured something that I love. And, and their entire model, if you look at how they incentivize people to come to their trade show, why people would want to come, why um, uh, you know certain customers in the sense that they are looking for supply chain needs. And so if you're like a brick and mortar retailer or, or a digital commerce provider, you have certain incentives to show. Um, if you're a kind of technology services company that's in the space like ours, um, they give us varying incentives to want to show up. Hmm. And, and the thing that I love about it the most is that all those incentives really involve around just like the same thing you were talking about, connecting people and being able to have conversations. And for a show of that size, I really, really appreciated how much time and effort they put into being able to have something that's so massive, but still make it feel quaint enough that the right types of people are able to connect with each other. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that I really love about that one. Mm. Good one. Shop talk. Um, and what about... Um, uh, E keynotes. I mean, you're out. I, I gathered you're out speaking quite a bit. Whether it's trade shows, whether it's uh, you know tr uh, industry association meetings, or whether it's hosting uh, tweet chats, what have you. It seems like you enjoy getting out there and, and really sharing the, the passion behind what you're doing at Viridian. I I do. I uh, to be really candid, for a long time, I just didn't know if people wanted to hear about you know my personal philosophies and how they impact supply chain. And so mm -hmm. for the longest time, I kept it pretty uh, confined to Viridian. And uh, honestly, um, even in the early years, I don't know if I shared too much internally with the team. It's just kind of some of the things that I personally felt as I was still really trying to find my own way as a, as a business owner. And so um, with, with a lot of the positive feedback internally and then, you know, some some recommendations for other folks. So yeah, I'd say in the last couple of years, I've, I've certainly gotten out there more and, and, and just tried to spread our, our message and kind of how we think. It, it's certainly not for everybody, but I do think that a lot of people um, could, could, could stand to benefit from some of these uh, ideas. Is, and so I, I do feel proud to push them out there. <laughs> well, I, 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 can, I can tell you that they want to hear your opinion. Mm. I mean, that's why we have a business is that they want to hear from you. And, and, in, and even more, they want to hear your growth along that journey as well. I, I think a lot of people really enjoy, t uh, you know, talking with people like Sandeep and, and understanding where he is today, understanding that he's an intelligent guy and that he's going to get to somewhere else later. I'm talking about him like he's not here. <laughs> Uh, um, but they want, you know, they want to know where you are now and they want to know where you're going and they want to be on that journey with you um, because you just might be going the direction that they want to go. So it, I think it's a it's a really valuable vehicle. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, this it, we've made a business out of it. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, it, and same thing. Right. It's it's you, your business is predicated on ideas and connections yeah. and, and talking to people. And, and and that's the thing that I always try to tell everybody is that it, it's it's so complicated to be alive as a human now. Um, the, the, the interconnection connectivity, the amount of information we have to consume, the stimuli that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. It, is, it is just, it is very hard time to just exist and function. And, and so just finding ways to simplify life. And like, I, I, I really focus on that. I just always come back to what's the idea? Mm. Yeah. What, what is the thought? Like, mm. let's, let's strip everything away. And if we focus on that, uh, we have a little bit of a beacon to guide us. I think in a way it's a good, the, 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 as, the aspects of social media, if you will, there are certain aspects of, of media generally that allow you to latch on to somebody really talented like you and go, I may never meet you, Sandeep, but I really like the way you think. And we can collaborate, right? We can share ideas without ever meeting. In the past, you're kind of stuck in your hole in your office, and and you might never meet any anybody outside your four walls mm. that could that could enlighten you, right? Or you could share ideas with. So I think I think it's a you know it's a double-edged sword. You're right, but I think there's there's a lot of upside to the complexity of the of the universe, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot to be done there. Just learning to navigate mm. it, I'd say. Yeah. Again, mm. uh, people always ask me, like, um, you know, do, do you have any tips for young business owners and, and, and or people that are wanting to start something new? And, and the advice that I always give them is just be very comfortable with the fact that just like everybody else in the world, all you're doing is failing at something until you stop failing at yeah. it. Mm. Don't don't let the failures get to you. Like it's just like with every other aspect of your life, you're, you're not going to be very good at it to start. 
So right, don't get, let it discourage you. Get used to eating peanut butter and jelly or rice or whatever your favorite cheap <laughs> meal is. Right. Ramen, ramen noodles, whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I, I want to touch on so much what y'all just shared in that last segment, but uh, for the sake of time, we're going to keep driving. Um, so, Sandeep, where can folks learn more, reach out to you, and, and connect with the Viridian team? Yeah, absolutely. The easiest place is our website. It's viridian.info. Um, and uh, we've, we've got some social media accounts with the same name, Viridian Info, on Twitter and Instagram, et cetera. So you can always just see what we're up to there. The blogs and white papers, like you said earlier, are also on the website as well. Um, and, and, and those are a really good slice into some of the um, ideas and feelings and just the overall thoughts that we, you know, we, we try to put out there on a consistent basis. And mm. so once we've uh, now, now that we've seen that there is a, a, um, some really strong appetite for, again, not necessarily action, but at least for ideas, we mm -hmm. we felt very compelled to try to do our best to you know take on initiatives like this and and get our message out there and, and you know share ideas with you gentlemen as well as put some put some content out there on the site as well. Yeah. Well, I would encourage you to uh, come out and share more. I, it's it's very interesting. Uh, the your role and what Viridian does is is drive, tackle, digest, and show others how how to lead through change. And, um, you know, as entrepreneurs, we all know how change can be stressful and, and it creates angst and, and, and all the things that comes with that, even even with the rewarding uh, side of, of breaking through change and, and somewhat comes comes with that. But there's a sense of calm about you, uh, Sandeep, and I, and I imagine you've heard it from other folks, but um, I can only think that that adds to as folks are sitting across the table and are trying to figure out, okay, who are the trusted resources we're looking at to bring it in and, and, and help us through this ever rapidly uh, uh, growing or, or speeding along rate of change. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that you bring in a very unique, that's a unique perspective. You ought to talk more. We hope to, hope to have you back on the show here because as we all know that there's a huge appetite for how do we digest change in the yeah. modern day-to-day -day supply chain. Yeah, I feel very calm right now. I mean, seriously. <laughs> it could, of course, yeah. it, it could be. I'm used to change, and I feel very, much more calm than It could usual. be the 80-degree day with a cool breeze in Atlanta. Maybe that's what has, has released some of the pressure. But, Maybe so. <laughs> but I, I really, Cindy, I really have enjoyed uh, your time here today. We've been speaking with Cindy Patel, managing partner with Viridian. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, and, thank you guys and, for having uh, me. Being here, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you. You bet. And to our listeners, again, you can learn more at viridian.info, right, uh, for a wide variety of content. Also, get to know the team there at Viridian. Okay, so Greg, we're going to wrap up. We were talk talking just a second ago about how we like to invite folks to come check us out in person. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, sat, we sat down probably with about 20 folks through about 15 different conversations last week at, at a two-day conference. We've got um, a couple shows coming up in uh, October, but coming up very next is October 9th here in Atlanta. Greg, what's happening? That is the Georgia Manufacturing Summit by the Georgia Manufacturing Association, right? Our friend Jason Moss. And, um, yeah, October 9th. So um, lots of panel sessions. Uh, I think about 1,000 attendees from ten, uh, some of the 10,000 manufacturers in Georgia and the companies that do business with them. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have open borders, so you're welcome to join <laughs> no matter who you are. Um, and uh, we're going to be broadcasting live. So a couple, uh, you've, you're running a panel session, right? Bo Groover from the Effective Syndicate is running a panel session. Um, and then we'll be broadcasting live. And and we have a couple of exciting potential guests there, some uh, foreign trade ministers from a couple of our neighbors. So, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting an interesting show. Big day. Big yeah. day. <laughs> if, if you love the manufacturing space, as Greg mentioned, it's come one, come all. It, 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 it's, it's one of my favorite events of the year. You can go to GeorgiaManufacturingAlliance.com and join or sign up uh, while registration is still open. And if you're a veteran and you're interested in a free seat, Jason Moss and GMA are giving up 50 free tickets mm -hmm. for veterans. So if you're listening to this show and you're interested in attending, you can use the code USA Vets uh, to sign up for a free seat. Okay, then we just recently confirmed we're going to be back in Charleston on October 23rd at the uh, SC Logistics Fall Tech Talk. Very good, yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah. A lot of folks from DHL Supply Chain, uh, Volvo, uh, numerous others going to be at this uh, half-day event really dedicated to innovation and technology within the logistics space, right? Right. 
Yeah, so the, um, so that that's the same group that we were just sharing some time with, right? And uh, the beautiful thing about going to Charleston in October is the weather will have broken, and it'll be very pleasant. And this time, I think I've already mentioned this, this time we are definitely going to Magnolia's for dinner. <laughs> that's right. right. We're not missing it. <laughs> so there's a couple different ways to learn about the event. You can go to sccompetes.org, or you can look up the SC Logistics 2019 Fall Tech Talk on Eventbrite. Yep. Again, registration's open. That's Wednesday, October 23rd from 12 noon to 5 p.m. And then we're traveling to Austin, Texas with e our friends at EFT. Yeah, Greg. the CIO Logistics Forum. So, uh, yeah, so Nick and the gang at uh, EFT putting on... Uh, an event for about 300, and, and I think you were mentioning these kind of events, about 300 tech execs and people who want to rub elbows with them and share ideas and solutions with these folks. Um, and uh, that's the 7th and 8th of November. Yes. We're going to keep Austin. Weird. <laughs> and we're only going to be tweeting each other at the conference. That's how we're all going to talk during lunch. I don't know if you did. Did you know that, that right? was in? It's yeah. all nothing no. but tweets allowed. Okay. Tweets and uh, Instagrams. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, my. Okay. I'm going to have to get my camera fixed <laughs> on my phone. So you can learn more at EFT.com or you can check out the event on our events tab at SupplyChainRadio.com to learn more. We're looking forward to broadcasting live there yeah. two days in Austin. Uh, then, of course, the calendar flips while well, we're working on a couple other events. Uh, we are confirmed to be at the Reverse Logistics Association Conference and Expo out in Vegas in February 2020. I uh, love our friends at RLA. Talk about a, a hot a sector of the Indian supply chain, oh, reverse yeah. logistics and returns. Gosh, if you are, if you don't have your strategy uh, figured out there, which, you know, a lot of companies don't. The RLA has done so much work just to pr uh, proliferate out best practices. Yeah. Um, so it's been really neat to be a part there. Um, and... In March 2020, Modex, of course, will be back here in Atlanta, right. and we're going to be broadcasting live all four days. Us and 35,000 of our closest friends, right? And, and one of the largest supply chain trade shows in North America, and Modex will also be hosting our 2020 Atlanta Supply Chain Awards, which we're excited about. It is free to attend Modex, so you can go to modexshow.com, and you can sign up for your free ticket and come out and, and uh, network and learn a wide variety of best practices all across the supply chain spectrum. And oh, is there, you want to go? You want to meet? Me? Please go ahead. Yeah, the Atlanta Supply Chain Awards, the oh. second day, March tenth. That's right, March tenth. Yep. So, um, yeah. So we enjoy um, seeing what's going on in the Atlanta supply chain in, uh, ecosystem, and you know, give out some awards for, to, to some of our top performers. I thought you were going to announce our big keynote speaker, which we we're, we're really close. Yeah, we've we've gone in a couple of different directions here, yeah. but we're really close to announcing uh, a sea level of a very large no I would, I would never do that I would let you do that <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> never step but, out of bounds that's not me but present company included we have really enjoyed our time with yeah. Sandy Patel managing partner of Viridian thanks again for joining us sir uh, be sure to our audience be sure to check out other upcoming events replays of our interviews other resources at supplychainnowradio.com you can find us on Apple Podcasts SoundCloud Spotify YouTube all the leading sites where podcasts can be found be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. And so Greg does not break my arm. On behalf of the entire Supply Chain Now Radio team, this is Scott Luton wishing you a wonderful week ahead. And we will see you next time on Supply Chain Now Radio. Thanks, everybody.